So now we're taking a look at kinetic energy and we're going to see how kinetic energy depends on both mass and velocity. So here's our equation right here, kinetic energy, Ke is equal to one half mv squared. All right. One small note, um, you'll sometimes see kinetic energy written as Ke. You'll sometimes see it written in our textbook as simply just K for kinetic energy. Um, sometimes you'll see it written as T. Unfortunately, for a lot of these uh, variables, um, there's more than one letter that we use to, to represent a particular quantity. And kinetic energy is one of those. Uh, potential energy is going to be the other one. Sometimes we'll use PE. Sometimes we'll use U. And um, it just depends on, um, it really depends on, on, uh, on who's uh, the author. So in any case, if you see a switching from KE to, to K, just understand that um, we're just sometimes trying to be consistent with the textbook. So kinetic energy, as its name implies, is a form of energy. It is a scalar. And once we do work on something and it's moving, the energy of motion is the kinetic energy, one half the mass times the velocity squared. What's not so obvious or so intuitive is this um, dependency on the velocity squared. Why does the energy depend on the velocity squared? Well, you can actually, you know, look at um, an analysis of this. When you look at, you know, work is equal to force times distance and force is mass times acceleration. If you do an analysis and you multiply acceleration times displacement, okay, you sort of get this m squared over, or over s squared. You get meter squared over second squared. And that's when you, you match the, the, you do a unit analysis, that's where that's coming from. Again, for energy, you know, it's kilograms, meter squared over second squared. So, um, you know, at least in unit analysis, you can see where the, that V squared is. But most people would think that, you know, as you double the speed, the energy would just double also. But really, that's not what happens. By doubling the speed, you are quadrupling the energy because the energy goes by the square. Triple the speed, the energy goes up by nine times. So that's just important to note that the energy does uh, go by the square of the speed. Um, again, where does this energy come from? Usually we need to do work to increase kinetic energy. We need to um, do negative work if we wanna get rid of the kinetic energy. And uh, you know, unlike the, the equation for work, which, which had an integral, a kinetic energy is really, really simple. It's just, it's always one half mass times the velocity squared. You know, as long as you don't keep going too fast and you've got to worry about relativity. So doing a calculation, here's a baseball. It's mass of 0.96 kilograms. That sounds like a little bit um, on the, the high side here. No, the, the actual mass of the, the baseball is, I'll have to make a correction here, 142 grams. And um, if we're throwing that around 95 miles per hour, uh, 42 meters per second, we get a kinetic energy about 125 joules. Now here is an important note for when you're doing these calculations. Order of operation, you always do the squares first. So um, in doing this calculation, square 42 before you do anything else because we do exponents first, then we do multiplication division next, then addition and subtraction. So exponents take priority right here. So square 42 first, then multiply it by everything else. And that'll give you the correct figure, okay? Very common mistake that people will multiply one half times, um, oops, I meant to get narrowed there. In any case, we'll multiply one half times M times V and they'll square the whole thing and think that, you know, that's the proper order of operations and it's not. 
uh, 80 kilogram person running 10 meters per second. Let's take a look at this one right here. 10 squared is 100, so it's 100 meters squared per second squared times 80, that becomes 8,000. We take one half of that, and that gives us 4,000. So a typical person running will have a few thousand joules of kinetic energy. An elite spinner will have maybe up to about 4,000 joules. And that's considerably more than this baseball here. You look at the baseball, we're throwing something with fairly little mass. Okay, and therefore its energy is not all that great. We're propelling the whole human body. Obviously the kinetic energy is gonna be much greater. Of course, racehorses put us to shame. Racehorses not only can go twice as fast as we can for much longer distances, they also have a lot more mass. So in this case, again, we do the calculation. Again, 20 squared is gonna give us 400 meters squared per second squared. We multiply that times 500. That gives us um, five times four is 20. Oops, it's going off the scale here. 20, okay. Then we have three zeros, one, two, three. 20, oh, I'm sorry, four zeros. So 400 times 500, I couldn't find the other zero. Okay, then we take one half that and we get 100,000 joules. All right, that's why I use a calculator. Let's talk about something truly massive. This is the Boeing 777. It's the 777-300ER. Um, <laughs> I think ER stands for extended range. It uses um, a very large engine we, we brought up before, the largest uh, turbofan engine available, the GE90. And at liftoff, this jet has an approximate mass of 350,000 kilograms and takeoff speed of 83 meters per second. So it's going uh, well over 170 miles per hour. Uh, before it can actually go airborne. It's really traveling at quite a high speed. All right, what are we doing with this? Well, we wanna know how much kinetic energy does it need uh, to gain before liftoff, before takeoff. Liftoff is more for rockets. Okay, so let's do this calculation. Here is the mass. We're gonna square 83 here first, okay? So 83 times 83, then times 350,000 times one half. That gives us an incredible 1.2, I'm sorry, 1.2 times 10 to the nine joules or 1.2 billion joules, okay? If we want to uh, use a different metric prefix, we would say 1.2 gigajoules, okay? Kill is a thousand, mega is a million, so giga is one billion. Quite a bit of energy uh, for takeoff. So 1.2 billion joules of energy. Now, let's consider the amount of thrust that this can generate. Um, red line test could get it up to about um, 569 thousand newtons of thrust, but normally uh, you're not gonna take it over 510 uh, newton, kilonewtons of, of thrust. So um, we have two of these engines on the plane. Let's say that they're both revved up to full throttle, just about one, um, well, roughly about um, one mega newton. Okay, roughly 1 million newtons. The question is, how long of a runway do we need to do this? Let's think about this. We're combining two things here. We're combining this idea of work. Work is equal to force times displacement for this particular case, okay? And that work's gonna become kinetic energy where kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So I've already said that we need about 1.2 billion joules 
of kinetic energy before we can take off, we have about one mega newton of force, okay? All this kinetic energy is coming from the work. So the work has to also be 1.2 billion joules. How much runway do I need to take off? Okay, let me do that calculation for this jet. Assuming that we can get to this maximum thrust of 510 kilonewtons. All right. Once again, um, on takeoff, this jet has about 1.2 times 10 to the 9 joules of kinetic energy that is added through work from the force of the engines. We know the force of the engines, and we want to solve for our displacement. Okay. How much work divided by how much thrust? All right, so, um, ooh, this is not good. I don't have units here. This should be joules on the top. It should be newtons on the bottom. In any case, 1.2 times 10 to the nine divided by 1.02 times 10 to the six means that it needs a staggering 1,200 meters or 1.2 kilometers in order to take off. Oh, is that reasonable? That's really long. That's almost a mile long runway. Um, how does that compare to something like Liberty? I'm sorry. Yeah. New York Liberty Airport. I mean, is that something we'd reasonably find at, at an international airport like this where these 77s fly out of? Again, you wouldn't see him, you know, coming out of Teterboro. The runway's too short there. You wouldn't see him coming out of municipal airports. They're just not made for it. These are international jets are made to take off of major airports, okay? Um, and again, we're not even using the, uh, the work done by drag acting against this. Obviously, um, the 1.2 kilometer long runway is for the ideal case where there is no air resistance. Honestly, if we redo this equation, okay, um, the 1.2 kilometers would actually be even more, okay, we get even more than this, it would go up because in this denominator, what we see right here is friction taking away some of the forward thrust or the, the net force would be the thrust minus the, the friction. So again, um, I don't know how great the, the drag is. Um, as we talked about at the end of the last chapter, in fact, the drag actually goes up by the square of the velocity. So it's really hard to, to even estimate um, how it, it impacted. But let's do something conservative here and say that at least we would expect maybe one half kilometer long runway would be required for this jet. All right. Let's look at what we have at Newark Liberty. Whoa, okay. So I said, you know, 1.5 kilometers would be the minimum, almost a mile long. Well, fortunately, we have um, three different runways. We have uh, 4L22R, which is 3.3 uh, kilometers or 3,353 meters long. Um, we have 4R22L, which is 3,048. Oh, and by the way, folks, these numbers that you see, these actually come from the, uh, the compass readings. You know, for instance, four represents um, 40, uh, you know, degrees 220 um, is represented by 22. So that's where those numbers are actually coming from. And uh, you can see the longer runways right here, okay, and the shorter runway here. And depending on which way the wind's blowing, you'd use these different ones. But clearly, um, with any of these runways, you probably have more than enough for a 777 to to take off um, and land 
without much much trouble. Okay, so again, that's a real nice problem right there. Again, you know, we calculated work as it is related to force and displacement. Actually, we calculate displacement, how far the plane has to go with those engines at full throttle. And also we use the equation for kinetic energy. And by putting the two together, we could get the total runway distance. <clears throat> 